It was March 15th, 2019. And a white supremacist had posted this racist manifesto online and then went on a live streamed shooting spree in mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, killing 50. And I wrote this sermon to speak out condemning those actions to lament that such a thing could happen, to mourn that it did, and to grieve with the children who lost parents, the parents who lost children. I was tremendously sad, and I was angry, and I was overwhelmed. And the words of the gospel for that Sunday, following that attack, were the same words with which God has addressed us this morning as we are still daily inundated with news of violence attacks and loss of life and the death of children and parents. How do I responsibly and adequately address all that needs to be addressed? I mean, is there anything that I can say or do to change the trajectory of impending world war. I feel powerless. Peace seems impossible. A sense of powerlessness is always a spiritual disease produced by the powers to keep us complicit. These are words written by Walter Wink in his book, Engaging the Powers. Anytime we feel powerless, we need to stop and ask, what principality of power has me in its spell? To give in to this sense of powerlessness is a surefire way to ensure that nothing will change. The reality is that we are quite powerful to do something. The powers that be just don't want us to realize this. When we feel powerless, we believe change to be impossible. And that's exactly the environment in which the powers that be thrive. So what power is at work in our world right now? Before we answer that question, we might need to better understand what Walter Wink is referring to when he uses the term powers that be. And so here's a quick though incomplete summary uh, by a guy named Ted Grismond. Wink argues that the language of principalities and powers in the New Testament refers to human social dynamics, institutions, belief systems, traditions, and the like. These dynamics, or what he calls manifestations of power, always have an inner and an outer aspect. Every power tends to have a a visible pole, an outer form, be it a church, a nation, or an economy, and an invisible pole, an, an inner spirit or driving force that animates, legitimates, 
and regulates its physical manifestation in the world. Neither pole is the cause of the other, but both come into existence together and cease to exist together. In Wink's view, we need such an integrated inner outer awareness to understand the world we live in and act effectively as agents for healing and transformation. As, as he puts it in engaging the powers, any attempt to transform a social system without addressing both its spirituality and its outer forms is doomed to failure. So this integrated inner outer awareness is what Jesus calls our attention to when he teaches us to pray that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus wanted our life to be influenced and inspired by God's will. But he also knew that we would encounter obstacles that didn't want us to realize the power we have to do good when God's Spirit is upon us. Within this worldview, Wink speaks of demons as the actual spirituality of systems and structures that have betrayed their divine vocations. This is another way of getting at what I described last week as ignoring spiritual intelligence. And all of this is just another way of getting at what it means to sin. To attempt to live and move and have our being apart from the will and influence of the ground of our being. Which is how Paul Tillich describes God. And life very quickly becomes overwhelming apart from the will and influence of God, apart from mindful and intentional attempts to breathe in the Spirit of God and be strengthened by its presence in us. And when one feels overwhelmed and powerless, fear and hate and anxiety take root, making us more willing to accept that hope and peace and love are impossible dreams. Feeling powerless made me think about Jesus being told that Herod wanted to kill him. I mean, in the decision to utilize violence against another, who is truly the powerless one in that scenario. I, I mean, I think we know who is supposed to feel powerless, the victim, and it's the aggressor's attempt to demonstrate their power. But not to get too far ahead of ourselves in the season of Lent, but wasn't Jesus' intention behind dying on the cross to totally delegitimize the empire's militaristic definition of power? Anyhow, within the realm of death, threats, and powerlessness, the warning of the Pharisees catches my attention. Go, they said to Jesus. Get away from here, because Herod wants to kill you. Does being enmeshed in the reality of war and threats of world war help us to recognize that Herod, the first century ruler of Galilee, does it help us recognize that Herod was a representative of the principalities and powers about which Wink wrote? Does it help us recognize that his threat to kill Jesus was an attempt to make Jesus feel powerless and to keep him complicit within the earthly systems and structures through which Herod 
maintained his own power. Recognizing Herod as a representative of the powers that be and his threat to kill as the ultimate attempt to make Jesus feel powerless. The Pharisees' warning becomes, in other words, go, get away from here because the powers that be want to make you feel powerless. And how does Jesus respond to this threat? No, he says, I'm, I'm not powerless. I'll continue casting out demons and healing people until my work is done. We have already seen the power of the Holy Spirit at work in Jesus when he, filled by the Spirit, spoke similar words of resistance to the temptations of the devil in the wilderness. The devil, writes Wink, is the world-encompassing spirit of the network of powers which have become integrated around idolatrous values. That is to say, powers which have just completely diverted accountability from God and from the influence of the Holy Spirit. It may be more helpful for us in this modern age to recognize Satan or the devil not as this personalized being with red horns and a pitchfork, but rather as a spirit or an influence that shows us, uh, that shows up to tempt or threaten us in those times when we feel the most powerless. It might also be helpful for us in this modern age to realize that we aren't powerless against those threats and temptations. It's cold out here. We're not powerless. If, if demons are the spirituality of systems and structures which have betrayed their divine vocations, then Jesus' insistence on casting them out is another way of saying, I will not allow you to make me feel powerless. This, I mean, this reminds me so much about what is going on in Ukraine right now. The words of President Vladimir Zelensky his refusal to leave his suffering people, their refusal to surrender to the so-called power of a nation and a leader, to legitimize that as being right. No, no, no. You are demonic and we will cast you out of our reality so long as the breath of the Spirit moves through us. Jesus was not going to allow the influence of these demons to overwhelm the people to whom he was ministering. Jesus heals us from the spiritual disease of powerlessness by which we are evilly evilly, easily overwhelmed and influenced by demonic impulses that offer us power if only we would worship the rulers of this world. That's the type of power that Putin is trying to claim for himself as a ruler of this world, as a man who has power because I control an army. What happens when we speak out against mass shootings or school shootings? When we try and debate gun control laws and talk about racism or Islamophobia or xenophobia or jingoism? When we talk about nationalism as a demonic possession of a people's ideology that makes them willing to oppress and go to war 
against members of another nation. The powers want us to feel trapped and helpless, but the Holy Spirit wants us to feel empowered and set free from demonic delusions. Pay attention to the voices who are speaking out loud, publicly. Who are they trying to influence and how? Are they using fear as their guiding force? Or are they using compassion? That's going to help you to recognize whose side God is on. God always sides with the vulnerable and the compassionate. God does not lend power to those whose ideologies of power are demonic. Jesus' lament over Jerusalem shows his awareness of those people's susceptibility to the demonic to be overwhelmed by delusions of powerlessness. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you. Despite the threat of Herod, despite knowing what awaits him in Jerusalem, despite the Pharisees' warning, nevertheless, Jesus persists like a mother hen longing to gather chicks under his wing. Jesus persists in his ministry of rescuing people from feeling powerless in the face of an overwhelming reality which is the threat of death. Jesus refuses to back down from serving and growing God's kingdom. And so my hope for us and our nation and our world is, is that we don't get caught up in the delusions of powerlessness produced by the threats of war. May we, in the face of this overwhelming reality, persist in showing love, compassion, concern. May we proclaim that there is another way forward, but that things must change. May we not fall away from our ministry as members of the kingdom of God to restore the systems and structures of this world to their divine vocations. The powers that be would love nothing more than for us to give up, to give in to temptation. When we feel powerless, may we recognize it as the Pharisees' warning. And may we respond as Jesus did. You tell that fox that we will continue throwing out demons in Jesus' name. We will continue healing this world today and tomorrow until we complete our work. Amen.